We're going to be having a look at this passage in Luke today. Uh, but be, before we do that, uh, let's commit our time to God. Um, I was really challenged in that, that last song. I bring, I bring my life as an offering. And wow, what a, what a challenge, hey? Let's lay our lives before God now and ask that he does what he sees fit. Father, we, just, we bring our lives to you this morning. We bring our hearts, uh, our minds. We ask, Father, that you would um, take us as an offering, that, Father, you would um, uh, use us, that you would encourage us, um, that, Father, you would speak to our hearts, that we would have ears that are ready and open and hearts ready to receive. Um, and, Father, we would not be going away from this place this morning and forgetting the things that you have spoken to us about. But, Father, we'd nurture that and we would grow that in our lives. So we commit ourselves to you, Father, in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Okay. Well, it's good to be here. It's good to have the opportunity to, to speak to you again this morning. And I'm, I'm speaking on such a wonderful uh, parable, the Good Samaritan. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a great uh, pleasure to do so. If you've got the passage in front of you, we see here that Jesus is confronted by a teacher of the law. And he comes to Jesus with this question and he says, what do I do to inherit eternal life? Now, the teacher of the law was not asking, what do I do to be saved or what do I do to get everlasting life or, or, or how, what do I do to get to heaven? As, as we might understand that question. What he's really talking about is, what do I do to, to get the life of the age to come or the life of the kingdom of God that he has promised to us? Or maybe to put it this way, how do I find the quality of life that God wants for me? How do I find the quality of life that God wants for me. Have we got our slides going, Jess? Good. And it's a great question, right? How do we find the quality of, of life that God has promised to us and wants for us? And it's a really good question. And Jesus, in his typical uh, rabbinical style, answers that question with another question. And he says to the man, in the second half of his response, he says, how do you read the law? And that was a loaded question from Jesus. He was throwing back this attack that the teacher of the law was putting on him and he was putting it back onto the teacher of the law and asking him, well, how do you read and understand and interpret the scriptures? And really what Jesus was asking him in that contemporary setting at that point in history was a question about what school of thought, Jewish thought, that he actually belonged to and what he was holding to. Now, hold that thought for a minute and we're going to come back to that. But the teacher of the law responds, doesn't he? And he says... Here and he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 4, 5, 4 and 5, or the part of the Shema. And then, importantly, he adds Leviticus 19, 18 on the end, which is, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. So, in response to Jesus' question, how do you read the law? The teacher of the law's response is, you shall love the Lord your God, the Shema, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. And you're going, what does that all mean? Well, there is a context and a historical context to understand to understand exactly the, the response that, that the, or the interaction that Jesus is having with this teacher of the law. And to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about, if we jumped ahead, a little bit about the Pharisees. We need to go back. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we need to 
understand a little bit about the Pharisees. And the teacher of the law would have come from, from the Pharisees. And this was a religious group. We're all familiar with the Pharisees in the first centuries, in the first century, who held on to the scripture as authoritative. And it was, it was a, came out of the religious revival after the Babylonian um, uh, period, after the restoration from Babylon. And that movement sought to increase uh, the piety or the, the, the self-holiness uh, and, and following of God in individual Jewish people by emphasising an application of the Jewish law of Moses to everyday life, rather than insisting on a, a priest-centred, temple-centred religious system, they sought to bring the word of God into the lives of people and individuals. And hence the synagogue movement grew out of this. And you, would, you had synagogues that came into the, the uh, various cities and towns scattered across Israel and people would be taught and instructed on the way of God. So this was the pharisaical movement of the time. And it'd be fair to say that the Galileans were dominated by this worldview, and this is where Jesus was mainly situated during his ministry and with whom most of his interaction was during his ministry. Now, while the Gospels typically portray the Pharisees as the enemies of Jesus, their, their objections to Jesus and their questioning of Jesus was often based on points that were important to the Pharisees when it came to the differing schools of thought within the Pharisaical movement. So there were two main sort of school, competing schools of thought amongst the Pharisees. So there was the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. And these two rabbis were pre-contemporaries of Jesus. So they lived around or just before the time of Jesus and were the most prominent rabbis of that time and are still prominent in Jewish thought today. Hillel was the grandfather of Gamaliel and if we know Gamaliel, Gamaliel was the one under whom uh, Paul sat uh, and was taught. So these were prominent rabbis of the time and they they were very distinct and they were, they were very different schools of thought, but they were both under the Pharisee worldview. And the question ultimately that the teacher or Jesus was asking back to the teacher of the law was which school do you belong to? Because that's what the teacher of the law was trying to extract from Jesus and Jesus wasn't going to give him that. So when it comes to the, the two different schools, Shammai and Hillel, the way that they interpreted or looked at the scriptures was slightly different. So you'll recall that Jesus in other places when he's asked what is the greatest commandment, Jesus says exactly the same as what the teacher of the law says here, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart and, and love your neighbour as yourself. So at the time, the two competing schools had two competing thoughts on what the greatest commandment is or the way in which you interpret scripture, the lens through which you should ultimately interpret scripture. Okay. Now, Shammai, Shammai summarised the greatest commandment as this. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, which is Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. And secondly, keep the Sabbath. So that was his greatest commandment. Hillel's was, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind, Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5. And secondly, you should love your neighbour as yourself, Leviticus 19, 18. So they had slightly different ways of perceiving the world and the scriptures through those lenses, those differing lenses. Shammai's emphasis was on obedience 
and I've put some resources in in, in the uh, newsletter and you can have a look at have a look at some more information on those guys if you're interested and, uh, and other stuff in there if you're interested if I forget to remind you. But Shammai's emphasis was on obedience while Hillel's emphasis was on love and we know that Jesus later or at other times in the gospel sides explicitly with with Himel, uh, sorry Hillel because his emphasis was on love but it wasn't always uh, Jesus didn't always side with Hillel at other times he would he would side with Shammai especially when it comes to marriage anyway getting back to the passage Jesus was leading the teacher of the law into a declaration of his understanding of the scriptures who he was siding with who were you siding with because the teacher of the law was saying Jesus who do you side with do you side with Shammai or Hillel Jesus wasn't willing to give that response at that time and throws it back to him and says well what do you think uh, is the most important uh, teacher to follow and the, the response from him was Hillel so that's the underlying conversation that's actually going on and everyone standing around in in that conversation understood that everyone except for us because we live 20 centuries later and don't really get all the nuances of of that conversation but that is what was going on so the poor old teacher of the law fails in his um, in his his uh, Tra entrapment of Jesus to get Jesus to side with one school or the other so seeking to justify himself and slightly embarrassed in front of a crowd that would have been slightly amused by his failure and probably giggling under their their breath at this poor guy he asks a follow-up question and the follow-up question is probably more controversial than the first question in which that he asks and the second question was, well, who is my neighbour? Again, this was a, a, an argument, a continual argument or dispute or disagreement amongst the two schools that, that were in uh, the Pharisee group of Shammai and Hillel. They saw these slightly differently. Shammai well let me back up if we have a look at the Leviticus passage and you got it there in front of you Leviticus 19:18, uh, it says this you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against who the sons of your own people but you shall love your neighbor as yourself I am the Lord so if you read that and this is straight out of Leviticus who is your neighbor that's an open question you're allowed to answer sorry so the your people yeah so to the Jewish reader here your neighbor is the sons of your own people who are the Jewish people so the interpretation the correct interpretation of this scripture both by, by both Shammai and Hillel was that your neighbor to whom, to whom you are to love was your Jew your fellow Jew there's no call in scripture to love anyone else you just love your own people and that's what this passage says they both agreed on that both Shammai and Hillel agreed that to love your neighbor was to love Jews only well not only so Shammai so the question then comes they were they were occupied by a Roman uh, Roman uh, people who had come in and taken over them and, and ruled them and the question often arose well should we love the Romans Shammai would say no he taught that no you don't God does not call us to love the Roman so there's no need for us to love them or to show any mercy or or care for the Romans Shammai remember whose emphasis was love his he found other scriptures to to say yes as a Jewish people we our neighbor uh, is the Romans and we ought to love the Romans and so this is where they the two schools again start to divide 
So Shammai would say, no, you don't need to love the Roman. Hillel said, yes, you do need to love the Roman. Importantly, however, both Hillel and Shammai agree that a Samaritan is certainly not your neighbour. And there's no need for a Jew to love a Samaritan. Both of them agreed with that. And so that's sort of like setting the, the framework of this story about why Jesus uses a Samaritan in this story about loving your neighbour. So who are the Samaritans? Let's have a, a quick look at that. If you don't recall, the Samaritans were the northern kingdom of Israel. So you had the southern kingdom of Judah, northern ki kingdom of Israel after they split in two. And in 722 uh, BC, the Assyrians came and invaded the northern kingdom, took them away, brought in a whole bunch of uh, Gentiles, mixed them up. And so they were a sort of a Gentile uh, Israel mix of people with different religions and, um, and so on. Uh, they also, their capital was Samaria. They had a temple in Samaria and they would worship uh, God in Samaria. They followed Jehovah uh, in, in a way and followed Torah, the, f the five books of the Bible, of the, uh, sorry, the first five books of the Bible. They, they didn't, didn't uh, follow the Psalms or, or those, those books or indeed the prophets, but they followed Torah. So they, they were under the law, as it were, and did follow uh, the law to some degree. Now, as far as contemporary life goes, well, that was, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years ago in Jesus' time, but it, you know, as far as contemporary life for a, for a Jew and the interactions between them and the Samaritans, there was still a great deal of angst. And I'll, I'll give you some, some insights into that now. In 128 BC, the Jews, uh, during the Maccabean period, went up into Samaria, completely destroyed uh, Samaria, the capital, destroyed their temple and, and completely ravished the land at that time. So that was only 100 years ago. That's still in people's minds and in people's hearts, right, especially the Samaritans. The Samaritans, on the other hand, as you've probably heard this before, were in the habit of when the Galileans would travel from uh, northern uh, Israel down to the temple for, to, to observe feast days like Passover, uh, they, would, they would mug them, uh, they would assault them while they're travelling on the road and that's why most of the time they would travel around, go the long way around Samaria to get to Jerusalem rather than travel through. And if you recall, Jesus travels through uh, Samaria and meets the woman at the well and has that conversation, which is not what a Jew would normally do. Around the time of Jesus' birth, a, a band of Samaritans went into the temple uh, they brought with them a, a whole bag full of bones and they scattered human bones all through the temple, desecrating uh, the temple. The Jews called Samaritans a herd. Um, talking about pigs uh, rather than a nation. And as, as you can see, there was, it was, there was a widely held Jewish proverb which went like this, a piece of bread given by a Samaritan is more unclean than pig's meat. And the worst insult that a Jew could give is found here in, in John 8, 28, when a Pharisee confronts Jesus and says, you are a Samaritan and you are possessed. So that was the worst insult that you could give someone is to call them a Samaritan. Now, on the face of, face of it, all those things, you go, oh, yeah, well. But it, it, the underlying root hatred that existed between these two, two peoples was deep. Uh, and the Jews hated the Samaritan and it manifested itself in this way. And so did the, the uh, Samaritans hate the Jews. So when Jesus comes to give this this uh, parable about a good Samaritan, 
it's extremely controversial in the, in the time and in the day in which he shared it. So let's have a look at that. And firstly, let's have a look at the way that, that, uh, that parable is structured. Firstly, the, the parable is, is structured uh, in, a, in a typical uh, rabbinical way. So the, the, the form that Jesus uses here is typical and expected and heard before by his Jewish listeners. So the ex and typically it would have been, if you can go to the next slide, typically it would be uh, a rabbi would use this format to teach um, a, a, a story. It may be a different story, but it went along the lines. There was a priest, a Levite, and a Pharisee. And the lesson would always be that the Pharisee did the right thing and that we learn the lesson from whatever the Pharisee did. And the, and the priest and the Levites are the props uh, to demonstrate exactly what we shouldn't do in contrast. So this was a, a template that, that the people understood and were used to hearing. It's much like an Australian, an Englishman, an Irishman walk into a pub, right? We know when, you, when I say that, that you're going to have a joke, that, that the Irishman is going to be the butt of the joke and the Australian and the, and the Englishman are just going to add to the stupidness of the Irishman. So when, when Jesus goes and launches into this parable about a priest, a Levite, when, they get, when he gets to the point of the third person coming the, along the road, the expectation in the listener is that um, a Pharisee is going to come along and the Pharisee is going to do the right thing. And lo and behold, shockingly, Jesus introduces a Samaritan into the story who does the right thing. And everyone would have been, oh, 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 what? That's just completely wrong. But obviously he does that. He's doing that to confront uh, his listeners and, again, to turn their whole world upside down. And it's completely, completely outrageous. So let's have a look at that. Let's have a look at the... The, uh, the parable itself and, and glean some of the truths that Jesus is, is, is trying to bring out to his, his listeners here in this. So let's have a look at the priests and the Levite first because we can put them together uh, for sake of time and, and, and really both of those are a prop uh, that are in contrast uh, to the Samaritan. So the expectation, as I said, the expectation is that the, the priests and the Levite are going to do the wrong thing. And they're going to be the examples of what you're not to do. And, and this is indeed exactly what, they, uh, what happens. Um, and, and that would be because typically the priests and the Levite belong to corrupt systems, systems that have been politically corrupted by Rome and, and compromised and their religious or their, their, the way in which they followed God had thus also been corrupted. And the expression and outward uh, expression of their, their faith had been corrupted. And so this type of teaching was to uh, also reinforce the Pharisaical worldview, uh, which was that, that following God through the, the Pharisee umbrella was the way in which to follow God rather than following after the priests and the Levites which who were corrupt uh, politically and and um, and every and in every other way if you look at the way they interacted with their people at the time however putting that aside for a minute let's try and look at it on face value and, and see and put ourselves into the seat or into the shoes, as it were, of, of the, the Levite and the priests and see what we can learn from the challenge that Jesus lays before us in, in this. And if you think about this situation and, and that the priests and the Levite find themselves in, both of them were walking along the road and 
up ahead they see a man. They can't, they don't see he's been, he's naked, he's been stripped of his clothes. They don't know, they don't know whether he's a Gentile and, or a Jew. If he's a Gentile and they go over and they come near him and touch him, they become unclean. If the man's dead and he's lying there as if he's dead, right, if they go over and touch him, they become unclean. Now, for us, becoming unclean is like a, well, wow. But for a priest or a Levite to become unclean, that was like huge. So a priest is someone who works in the temple and to become unclean means, bang, he's stopped, he's ostracised outside of the priesthood until he, he, uh, uh, he remedies his, his ritual uncleanness. And to, to remedy his ritual uncleanness, he'd have to get an oxen. He'd have to go purchase, purchase an oxen, right? Now, imagine, put yourself in this position. You now, if you go over and help that person, you potentially have to go buy a, a, a big cow and you've got to slaughter it. You've got to burn it until the whole thing turns to ash. Now, that's not going to take you a night. That's going to take you some time to get your barbecue stoked up to burn down an oxen, right? So it's huge inconvenience if, if he makes himself unclean. Not only the shame, not only the fact that he's on, his job as a priest, so his job's disrupted, he can't do his job. You can't do your job you can't go to work, you can't do what you're supposed to do, you're ostracised and, and, um, and you have to make it right. So it's a disruption to his life, disruption to his personal uh, reputation, a disruption to his financial well-being. And why? What for? If it's a Gentile, God doesn't even call me to love him. I don't even have to. God doesn't ask me to do that because I only have to love a Jew if you take the Shammai view or a Jew and a Roman if you take the um, Hillel view. And besides, there's no one on the road, no one else here, no one sees me if I walk by. It's only between me and God, right? And besides which, if I stop... There's probably robbers around. He's just put him there as a bait and they're going to jump out and rob me. So I shouldn't really put myself in personal danger because if I do that, I'm risking my family and their well-being. It's probably best for my family and for me as a good husband just to walk by. There's a lot of arguments, right? And it's not a simple thing. And we stand here and sit in judgment of the poor priest and the Levite. But really, I'm not sure if all of us would have stopped at that point. I'm not sure I would. The other thing that Jesus points out is he, he passes by on the other side of the road. That's stinging, isn't it? Doesn't even go over and look. He just, you know, walks by on the other side of the road. Don't want to get involved. Don't want to even look at it. Don't want to know about it. And if that's not a challenge to your heart, <laughs> it's certainly a challenge to mine when we see people in need and people around us who need our help and often it's like oh. but let's have a look at the samaritan's response that's far more positive right but i think just as just as just as challenging when the samaritan sees sees the man jesus says he saw him and he had compassion. Wow. Let's have a look at that word, that word compassion. The word compassion is used many, or not many, several times in the Gospels. I'm going to read you a few, and I want to see if you can pick out the theme. In Matthew 9:36, it says this, When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them. Luke 15, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. That's the story of the prodigal son. Matthew 14, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. In Mark, Matthew 15, it says, when Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they've been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. 
In Luke 7, it says this, And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said, Do not weep, talking about the, the widow uh, who lost her son. Every single time you see the word compassion in the New Testament, it refers to Jesus or the Father. No place is the word compassion used in, in the Gospels where it refers to anyone else except for Jesus or the Father. So who is Jesus talking about when the Samaritan has compassion on the man on the road. Jesus is, is t talking to us that the Samaritan is him, that he is the one who loves the one who has been fallen on the side of the road. Jesus is describing his great love and the Father's great love and compassion for those who have fallen and are in need. And indeed, by placing himself as the Samaritan, Jesus is saying, I am the one who loves, I am the Samaritan, and you hate the Samaritans. How can you love me, he's saying to his disciples, and hate the Samaritans? By hating the Samaritans, you hate me. And isn't that true? You cannot love me and hate a Samaritan. I am the Samaritan, Jesus is telling his followers. But the response of the Samaritan is, is unconditional love, isn't it? It's not conditional upon anything at all. It's not a love based or a compassion based on labels or affiliations or ethnicity, or colour, you'll note that the man lying on the ground, he's naked. There's no hijab to define his religious background. There's no tasseled garments to show that he was a Jew. There was no turban to say he was a Sikh. He was just a human being. Jesus did that deliberately. He wants us to see people not for the labels that, that are ascribed to them, but for their humanity in their nakedness of their humanity. Jesus saw him as a human without labels. To Jesus, labels were inconsequential and they should be inconsequential in the way that we love other people. We cannot love people if we hold to labels and if we can't see past them. And not only that, it, it's an active love, right? The Samaritan's love is an active love. I think uh, in, in the sermon I've attached in the newsletter, uh, Reed Dent, he gives the example of his, of his wife uh, uh, praying for a homeless man, which is a wonderful act, right? pray for a homeless man um, but <laughs> it falls way short of of what God calls us to do Jesus didn't say the Samaritan stood there and prayed for the man and then walked on <laughs> it's it's not enough God Jesus calls us to get our hands dirty to get them bloody to, to become unclean. The Samaritan goes over to the man, he practically gets messy, right? It's messy. He has to pick him up and bind his wounds. It's kind of cost him money. He, he follows Torah. As a Samaritan, he follows Torah. He also becomes uncle, ritually unclean. He incurs great costs. He has to get him onto his donkey. He has to go take, takes him to an inn. He pays for it. It's just messy. He's going to come back. It's really inconvenient, right? But that's what active love does. It gets involved. So who is our neighbour? Who is my neighbour? According to Jesus, it's anyone. 
it's anyone whom God brings across our path. It's not, it's not Jews only, it's not Romans only, it's anyone and everyone. Uh, whether they're a friend, whether they're a foe, uh, whether the person we like or the person we dislike, whether it's the person uh, whom you know, we, we have an issue with or it's uh, uh, someone else. It's whomever God brings across your path and puts in front of you because God's put them in front of you for that purpose. It wasn't an accidental meeting between the, the Samaritan and, the, and this man. It was a divine appointment. I'm not going to give you a bunch of examples on how God might bring people across your path. I'm sure God is able to do that and bring that into your own mind and I'm sure he he perhaps has done that already this morning. All God is calling us to do is to act positively and respond to his calling on our life to, to stop and uh, love other people. And sure, we, we all fail and we've failed in the past and we've walked by on the other side. I have, you have, we all have. Uh, but that doesn't define who we are and doesn't have to define what we do in the future. So let's allow God to change us and to make us good Samaritans, to make us people uh, who follow Jesus, who reach out with the hands of Jesus, as the hands of Jesus, uh, to touch and heal other people's lives. More than that, I think... And, and Jesus alludes this to this, doesn't he, in this passage. We have Matthew 5.43. Jesus says, You've heard that it's said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. Right? Yeah, that was, and, and you can see that reflected in the teaching of Hillel and Shammai, which we've already talked about. You can, you're allowed to hate your enemy. And Jesus corrects that in Matthew and he says, But... I say to you, love your enemies. And Jesus' call on our lives is, is far greater uh, than the contemporary call to love uh, in, in his day and age upon the believers at that point in time. And he was bringing something not new, because it wasn't new, uh, God had always had that there in the, in the scriptures, but he was correcting uh, the way in which people were interpreting the Bible at the time. And loving your enemies is tough, right? And, uh, and um, that's not an easy thing to do. And, uh, you know, something I've struggled with in the last few weeks is, is, is and I was sharing with Tim about this recently uh, and it's something that doesn't you can't come to and you can't do overnight loving people that you are really struggling with but God Jesus is calling us to do that it's not something to be ignored it's not something to just put to the side as too hard and that's what God's been challenging me about and we do that I think we practically come to to love people by understanding our own humanity, uh, understanding that, like everyone and, and the people that we hate, uh, that we are frail, we have faults and failures, and that we need to forgive other people as much as they forgive us. And it's asking God to help us through this process because, indeed, loving other people is is loving Jesus. Loving our enemy is loving Jesus. And that's what he's telling us here in this, in, this, in this passage, that I am the Samaritan. I am your enemy. I am the one whom you hate. Don't hate your enemy. Love me. Practically, I think, for me, it's been praying for those, those people that, that I've been struggling with, praying for their, their spouses, praying for their children and allowing God to soften my heart and take that hardness away and change it and remould it into love for Jesus. 
and responding when God brings those people into my life again in a positive way. So just a closing thought on this passage. It's a challenging passage, which I think practically for us all. But jumping back to, to the teacher of the law and his initial question, how do I find the quality of life that God has for me? That, that, that life, how do I get that? How do I get the life here now that God has for me? And I think Jesus answers it with these answers. Love people. Love them unconditionally and actively. Pour yourself out into the lives of other people. That's how you find your own life. Don't pass people by. On the flip side, don't pass people by or place labels on them to excuse your love um, for them. And learn to love. Some, sometimes love, loving people doesn't come naturally. Uh, to love, and especially your enemies, it's, it's very unnatural to love people whom you've got a lot of angst against. But you've got to actively allow God to teach you to love them and work on that in your own life. And then once, you know, and then that's where we find the quality of life that God has for us. That's where we find joy. That's where we find uh, closeness with God. And that's where he's brought, brought glory and brings transformation into our lives and into the lives of others. Okay, thanks guys.